All right. Um, so thank you for joining today. Uh, I'm Sam Lindsay from Fortify, and today we are joined by Phil Lambert from Fortify, as well as Trevor Polidor to talk about the development of 3D printable photopolymer for RF applications. Thanks for the introduction, Sam. And thanks to everyone for joining today. We're here to discuss the development of a 3D printable photopolymer for RF applications. First, I'd, take, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Fortify. Fortify was spun out of Northeastern University about six years ago, and it's a venture-backed company with this latest fundraising round in 2021. We raised $20 million, led by Coda Capital. Uh, we're in Boston, Massachusetts, and located uh, at the Old Hood Milk Factory. And Fortify is a 3D printer OEM, which means we design, manufacture, and sell machines and 3D printing materials. We have three models of DLP printers, all with a sizable build volume of 8 by 4.5 by 13 inches and a pixel pitch of 75 microns. The machines are specifically designed to handle challenging to print fiber filled and highly viscous photocurable resins, making the system design capable across a wide range of materials, including those with unique RF properties. Which brings me to the topic of Ludenberg lenses. A Lundberg lens is a type of grin device. Uh, this concept isn't new. In fact, Lundberg lenses have been around since, the concept at least, has been around since 1944. And a grin device is an electromagnetic structure with a continuous spatially graded index of refraction. The index of refraction of the dielectric material is a function of permittivity. So by tuning the permittivity across the device, like in the graphic on the bottom right, it's possible to deliberately and constructively refract incoming RF energy. This phenomenon can be used to create unique and impactful RF devices. Historically, grin devices have been economically inaccessible for most applications. In each of the manufacturing cases shown here on the, on the slide, the complexity of the, the, of the device creates huge manufacturing bottlenecks. In some cases, you need to precision manufacture a multitude of shelves or wedges and then attempt to assemble them without generating air gaps between each of the dielectric materials or each of the dielectric elements. The result is that the grin device uh, historically have been expensive, very time consuming to manufacture and often inadequate in their performance due to the limitations I described earlier. Through conversations with customers, review of academic publications, and reviewing what is commercially available in the industry, there are a few known 3D printing technologies making headway in printing these grin devices. Uh, the, the approaches we're aware of are shown here, fused filament fabrication or material jet uh, or uh, direct write being one, material jetting technologies like polyjet being another, and then also photopolymer technologies like stereolithography and digital light processing are used as well. When thinking about uh, these printing technologies and what materials make the most, most sense for RF devices, we think about loss. Uh, for a high performance RF device, we want the loss in the material to be as low as possible. And so when thinking about this critical performance characteristic and the scope of a, an available of, of all available 3D printing materials, photopolymers have always struggled to compete. Looking at this chart, which is plotting the dielectric constant uh, on the y-axis, yeah, of a variety of 3D printable materials to their dissipation factor or loss, which is on the x-axis in a logarithmic scale, we can basically draw a line right down the center. Uh, where, on the, where the materials on the right have a higher loss, and you find the photopolymers. Materials on the left, in the direction of the lower loss, you find thermoplastics. These thermoplastics, these thermoplastic materials inherently exhibit lower loss characteristics. For grin devices, there are benefits and drawbacks to each of the 3D printing technologies uh, that are currently being used. Fused filament fabrication or direct write can leverage a naturally good electrical properties of thermoplastics, but extrusion technologies are bound to the rough trade-off between build speed and feature resolution. You go to higher size nozzles, you can print faster at the sacrifice of your feature resolution. Material jetting, on the other hand, has a potential for high throughput, excellent feature resolution, but is limited by poor electrical properties of the available materials. Sort of the same story with SLA, with some of the throughput challenges being tied to rastering, laser rastering times. 
Um, the takeaway here is that some of the, these existing additive manufacturing technologies may have great RF properties, excellent feature resolution or high throughput, but typically do not have all three. There is a need in industry for a competitive RF material that can leverage the throughput and resolution of DLP printing. Moving on for just a second to Flux Developer. So Flux Developer is a software product that enables new materials development on four to five Flux series of printers. So I think you know where I'm going with this. Flux Developer uh, at a high level uh, starts with materials formulation and customers like Rogers, for example, can run through a series of onboarding experiments to better understand the processing characteristics of the materials. Um, those, those experiments include photokinetic analysis, build plate adhesion, sedimentation rate analysis, and rheology experimentation. The photokinetics analysis and build plate adhesion are actually customizable experiments that would live right on the printer host UI. After running through some, some of those experiments, you move over to materials profile creation. Uh, this is a, a, a browser-based app we call Flux Portal where the users can develop custom material configurations, the recipe for printing a material and control parameters like UV dosage, UV intensity and build plate movement speeds. The Flux Portal also has a complete list of all prints and associated material configurations. So there's a full history of every experiment you've run as you walk through this workflow. From there, users can then run prints and evaluate the results. So now I'd like to hand it over to Trevor Polidor, Rogers Corporation, and he'll tell us about their new RF polymer dielectric material and how they leverage Flux developer tools and the FlexCore 3D printer to develop this material and print cool gradient refractive index devices. Great, thanks, Phil. So um, as Phil discussed, you know there was a gap in materials available for DLP 3D printing for RF applications. And what Rogers has done is we've launched the first RF material for DLP 3D printing. Um, it's our Radix 2.8 DK material, and we launched it January this year. Um, and we partnered with Fortify to deliver a complete manufacturing solution for complex RF dielectric components. And the idea here is that we can give our customers the new design freedom Phil talked about to create new complex components that can't be made with traditional manufacturing processes like these Lundberg lenses. And so our Radix 2.8 DK material is uh, an order of magnitude lower loss than traditional photopolymers today. So what Phil was showing about the discrepancy between thermoplastics and photopolymers for 3D printing um, is now solved with this Radix dielectric material platform. And uh, as Phil talked about the trade-offs between different 3D printing technologies, um, we saw a similar uh, issue in availability of 3D printing processes that could produce parts with feature sizes and surface finishes suitable for RF and millimeter wave frequencies um, that had RF materials available. And so um, when we compare processes like FDM and Polyjet, um, there hasn't been a process with the combination of resolution, scalability, and materials that are suitable for RF. And so what Rogers decided to do was basically uh, take advantage of DLP printing processes, which have excellent resolution and are scalable processes, and basically fill that gap of the lack of low loss materials available. And so what we've been able to do is produce this Radix dielectric material in partnership with Fortify. Um, that is the lowest loss uh, microwave material for DLP 3D printing. And the way we did that is by working with the tools Phil described about uh, material development with Flux Developer. And our goal was to develop the first RF 3D printing material for specifically a robust, repeatable, and scalable platform. And so um, that's why we chose to work with Fortify is really to bring the production possibilities to end use scale. And with any material development that involves a lot of formulation and iteration. And the best thing that we've seen and we've been able to do with this Flux developer process is shorten that cycle time between getting feedback on how the material prints or behaves in application to being able to make a revision on the formulation and basically do that cycle again. And with the tools available, we were able to get to a robust material and 
a material profile that can produce high resolution parts um, robustly. And one of the benefits of this technology too is that, you know, with the CKM system, with that mixing and the constant suspension of filler, um, we can create components that produce extremely consistent parts throughout the build volume. And so if you take a look at the information in the bottom right of this slide, you can see that throughout the whole build volume on the printer, we get extremely consistent parts with the filler suspension uh, system in the four to five 3D printers. So as we talk about the design advantages of 3D printing, there are a handful of applications we can use this technology uh, for RF dielectric components. Um, for example, we've been talking about gradient index lenses. Um, this is really the only way in a one material system produ to produce uh, real, truly continuous gradient dielectric constant components um, with no limitation in terms of how that gradient arbitrarily gets changed throughout a three-dimensional space. Um, but there also is the ability to take that same design freedom and combine it with metallization techniques like laser activated electrolysis processes and conductive inks um, to start looking at new volumetric and conformal circuits that can't be uh, made with traditional fabrication processes. So the optimization capability, now that you have this new geometric freedom, um, you know, the possibilities are pretty endless. But on the lens side specifically, what we wanted to do is design and demonstrate these lenses in application. And so what we did is we took a conventional Bloomberg style lens um, design and we built a system that's fed with an open waveguide to test the lens at KA band. Um, and so we designed this lens to be fed with an open waveguide. So the dielectric constant gradient is a little bit different than the conventional literature-based Lundberg lens, which is one, one to two if you're using an isotropic radiator. But since we're having this system fed with an open waveguide, uh, we had to tailor dielectric properties a little bit in ANSYS HFSS. And you can see the output on the bottom right, the dielectric constant value at different uh, points across the lens. So this is a radially symmetric lens. So what we decided to do was print this lens with two materials, our new Radix low loss dielectric material and a standard DLP resin, um, and then test antenna patterns as we rotated the lens to make sure that we had consistent performance across uh, the surface of the lens. Um, this design was also scaled down. So the same number of wavelengths across uh, to perform at V-band applications, and those same measurements were done on that lens as well. So what we were able to achieve uh, was um, pretty great. We had the KA band lens that matched simulation. We were able to achieve over 23 dBi peak gain at 30 gigahertz, which is a 3 dBi gain improvement over the standard DLP uh, material, which is a urethane methacrylate based material. So we can see the manifestation of the loss in this lens application is pretty significant. Even since these structures have a lot of air in them, um, really the, the loss at millimeter wave frequencies is gonna have a huge impact on the performance of these electrically large apertures. Um, we also were able to show that in every position across the surface of the lens, we got equal gain performance, basically indicating the ability to steer um, uh, continuously uh, 180 degrees on the surface of the lens. And for the V-band lens, we also saw uh, you know, very high realized gain throughout the band. Again, this is fed with the WR12 uh, coax to waveguide adapter for this higher band. And all we really did is take that same design and scale it down to the same number of wavelengths. And we got a lens, a uh, pretty efficient lens uh, that produced up to 23 dBi of gain. Uh, throughout that band. And again, rotating that lens uh, across the feed produces the same amount of gain. So you can envision an uh, antenna structure with multiple feeds along the surface of this lens and switching between them to get an antenna system that can steer uh, 180 degrees or more. So I'm going to hand it back to Phil, and he's going to talk a little bit more uh, about the Fortify technology and where we're going next with the Radix materials. Thanks, Trevor. This groundbreaking Radix material is available for our customers right now. Folks who use it will have access to new design freedoms previously unreachable for RF device designers. 
With this combination of material and processing capability, Fortify and Rogers are making it not only possible, but economically feasible to print a wide range of devices and geometries. The images on the right show a few examples of the mass production capabilities for grin lenses on the top, uh, RF characterization plaques right in, the, in the middle image, and then three-dimensional RF substrates for applications like 3D circuits. But the benefits continue beyond pure RF performance, even when compared to other polymer devices, such as this six-inch Rexolite hemispherical lens in the center image. The weight savings are considerable. The six-inch Lundberg lens weighs less than a pound. That's the image on the right, uh, compared to over two pounds for the solid constant dielectric uh, constant K dielectric lens. Those weight savings mean a lot, especially for designers and engineers who are constantly battling against C-swap, cost size, weight, and power considerations. Furthermore, manufacturing of this high-performance grin Lundberg style lens is actually scalable. Considering the parallelization capabilities of DLP, device throughput impressively accelerates. As DLP cures entire cross-sections of a build plate in a single exposure using a projected UV light mask, one part or five parts will print at the same rate, providing they can fit on the build platform. In the case of the 62 millimeter diameter Lundberg style lens Trevor was discussing for the KA band, we can fit about five of these lenses on the build plate at a time. With a build time of about 10 hours, the throughput is roughly two hours per lens compared to fused filament fabrication, which can take an estimated 10 hours to complete a 62 millimeter lens. The flux core can produce five lenses in about a fifth of the time. And there's more to come. Fortify and Rogers are currently in development right now with a higher dielectric constant polymer, with a dielectric constant 4.9 and a loss tangent of 0039. Uh, this material is slated to have uh, excellent material properties with low moisture absorption. And uh, because of that higher base dielectric constant, uh, the material have uh, expands what is, uh, what is possible for grin devices, meaning you have a much wider range of achievable effective permittivities within a single device. And we'll release more information as we continue to mature this product. So that's it for me. Thanks to everyone for listening. My email is listed on the slide here if you'd like to connect. Uh, I, I will now hand it back to Sam, who'll lead us through some Q&A. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Um, so now it's time for some Q&A. So let me check that. Okay, so uh, we have a few questions. Um, what frequencies have you tested up to? Yeah, I can, I can take that. So, um, you know, I showed the, uh, the V-band lens and tested up to 85 gigahertz. You know, that's still um, being evaluated further. And really the limitation is just uh, the feature size of the, the lattice that we can produce uh, with the material. And so, um, we're doing all the studies now to try to push it beyond, um, you know, V-band into E-band and, and possibly W-band. But right now, you know, we've evaluated it up to um, about 85 gigahertz where we know we can produce parts. Um, I'd like to also make a point on the lower end, right? You know, you have the limitation of the size of the build volume of the printer as well to be able to produce a part in one uh, print. Um, so, you know, the limitation, there's also a lower frequency limitation where you'll have to be putting multiple parts together again um, if you're going to, um, you know, something below 10 gigahertz or, or something like that. Um, but we're doing studies as well, and, and we have, um, you know, research ongoing there on how to join these parts together so you can get seamless integration for a larger lens. Thank you. Um... So someone did ask, uh, what printer did we use? So what Fortify printer did we use, Bill? Yeah, that printer that we um, are using to print the dielectric material is called the Flux Core printer. Uh, I mentioned, we showed a slide earlier that showed three different printers. Uh, the printer that we're using here uh, is, a, is a machine that has a technology called CKM, continuous kinetic mixing, uh, that we leverage to make sure we have homogeneous suspension uh, and um, and mixing of this material, right? This is a fiber filled polymer system. And the flux core machine is the system, one of the systems that's integrated with a CKM technology to facilitate the suspension and mixing of this material as you're printing. So uh, we can get homogeneity throughout the system. And Trevor showed a slide on that. Um, 
where they've done some tests to demonstrate that homogeneity is consistent across the build volume. Thank you. Um, what is the process for removing the extraneous plastic from the part? That's a great question. You know, one of the challenges we run into when we're printing these lattices is that we are generating a lot of channels that are really challenging uh, to clean. Um, and so we, we leverage a series of, of, of uh, sequential cleaning processes. We typically start with compressed air to remove as much material and recollect as much material as possible um, prior to using these solvents. But then we typically move on to a solvent bath where we agitate um, and try to get uh, solvent penetration into those channels so we can drain out the material. There are, um, there are limits. You know, we are creating really small channels in order to get to very high effective permittivities within that range. Um, that's achievable within a given material. And uh, as you get to smaller channels, cleaning becomes more challenging. So there's trade-offs you can make um, in, your, in your process workflows for creating these devices. Okay, thank you. Um, going through the questions here. Um, what temperature ranges can these materials be operated with then? Yeah, so... Um... You know, it really kind of depends on the system. You know, the decomposition temperature of the radix materials are above 300 degrees Celsius. And so um, you uh, won't see much of a, a, you know, glass transition throughout the operating uh, temperatures up to that point. Um, but there'll be, you know, increased thermal expansion as uh, temperature increases when you're using the materials. So depending on the limitations of um, thermal expansion, you know, that'll dictate um, your, your temperature operating range, but we've um, put these materials through solder reflow cycles and um, temperature uh, studies like that, that mimic those elevated temperatures um, and the material can uh, survive pretty robustly, um, but the decomposition temperature will, will start around 300 degrees C. Okay. And then uh, can you explain a little bit more about the metallization techniques? Yeah, so um, you know we're evaluating uh, some metallization techniques to, to kind of complement the the new design frame. What we've been looking at are um, you know kind of freeform, three dimensional, conformal metallization. And um, right now, one of the the best techniques we have is um, a laser activated electroless process. Uh, and we're we're working with a company called Veritech um, uh, to get that uh, available to our customers with this material. And what that basically does is allows you to selectively deposit bulk copper, you know, because you can go through traditional electrolytic uh, electroplating processes after that um, electrolyst step. And so um, that's uh, probably the best technique we have today. And we're building out um, a data set to, to share with customers um, on how that technique behaves with our material. Um, but that's the, the best technique we have available today to get real bulk um, metal conductivity for um, stringent RF applications. Um, the material is compatible with other ink techniques, so aerosol jetting, uh, silver inks, nanoparticle inks, and reactive um, metal inks is also possible, but um, to really get the performance uh, for, for high frequency applications, you know, we're looking at um, some selective metallization techniques like the Veritech process today. Thank you. Um, how scalable is the size um, in the process? For example, how would one build a six foot part? Hmm. It's a, <laughs> you wait a few years until you have a bigger printer available for you is, my, is the real answer. Um, the, you know, so like Trevor was talking about, we are exploring technologies for printing and joining components. As you get to lower frequencies, when you think about that lattice structure, um, you know, all the, everything scales relative to wavelength. So if you're thinking about a big six foot part at very low frequencies, then maybe you're not so challenged on how small of a feature you need to print. You just got to print large. Uh, so I, what I would say is you maximize our build volume. We've got a 13 inch Z height, um, which means we can print parts that, you know, the largest part we could print if we filled up the build, build volume is four and a half inches by eight inches by 13 inches. And, um, and then we do some tiling if, if that is the process you're looking forward to explore. Um, otherwise, we are uh, scoping some larger machines uh, in, our, in our product roadmap, which are coming down the pipeline in the next few years. All right. Um, I think we're uh, 
We have a lot of questions, um, but one that I keep seeing sort of answered or asked a few times in different ways is how would one get access to this material and um, the machine? Yeah, so um, for the Rogers material, right, it's available for um, customers with Fortify equipment directly through Fortify. So if you did have Fortify 3D printing equipment, you can purchase resin directly um, through that channel. It's also, you know, available from, from us as well. But um, I'd like to point out that, you know, we want to be able to uh, lower that barrier to entry to start working with this technology. And so Fortify, um, and, you know, Phil can speak to this too, is also uh, able to offer, you know, services for producing parts um, to, to evaluate the technology rather than, you know, just uh, buying a printer and working with the resin from day one. So we're really offering a, a few different avenues there to, to kind of get access to the technology. I don't know if you want to add on to that. Yeah, yeah. So the one thing I, I do want to add here is that it is a photopolymer, which means it can be cured with UV light. And I know there's people out there with machines that can print SLA materials and they're wondering if it works in their machine. Um, you know, the one challenging aspect that I just want to highlight here is that the material is filled, which means that it has sediment, that it has uh, sedimentation risks. And, uh, and what can actually happen over time is that the, the material um, that's loaded into this system um, can separate from the bulk resin unless it's being uh, consist, constantly agitated and mixed. And that's where CKM really comes in. And so you may be able to make parts, but you may, uh, on other systems, but on the Fortify machine, you'll be able to consistently make parts. You'll be able to consistently make parts with consistent material properties um, from one build to the next. So um, I guess just a little pitch for the CKM system there. All right. Um, so along the lines of CKM, someone asked, can the CKM process be used to create materials that are not homogenous at various levels in the buildup? Uh, in theory, yeah. Um, in practice, that's going to be uh, a bit of a challenge. You know, CKM was designed to take a system, a material system that is pre-mixed and keep it mixed and suspended. Um, one could conceive of adding fiber particles, you know, over the course of a print. It would be a manual process. It's not designed for it. But in an R&D environment with the Flux developer tool sets, uh, someone could explore the potential of, of um, variable particle filler concentrations across the field. Great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so can you explain more about how you can get from the desired effective index values in space to the complex features shown? I, I think this is a question about how we get from um, like a desired permittivity values to a result in geometry. Um, if I understand that question correctly. And so I'll answer that question. Um, we have a, a workflow that we've built out here that leverages an off the, off the shelf um, piece of software called Intopology. And what, you, what we're effectively doing is using a, a mixing equation. So we are able to, within a given frequency, um, select a unit cell of a lattice. And within uh, using that lattice, we can populate a volume. And by modulating the volume fraction of that lattice um, as it correlates to a volume fraction that correlates to um, an effective permittivity for that material, we're able to then generate the correct uh, wall thickness of that lattice for that given effective permittivity. And so by distributing those effective permittivity values across the device and then correlating that to a volume fraction of a unit cell that is effectively sized for your wavelength, uh, of, of application, um, we're able to generate a 3D geometry. And from there, we can convert it into a build file. Yeah, so when you're you know, working in simulation software like HF HFSS, um, you, know, you don't really need to think about that microstructure. You just really need to think about um, you know, where to put certain effective permittivities um, in your design and as a monolithic structure. And then you know, that workflow Phil described you know, it is pretty turnkey. You don't really need to work about, worry about um, how to get to that endpoint as long as it's within our operating um, range. You know, that's that's something that um, we'll be able to to get for for you. So, great. All right, thanks, guys. I think we're at time. Um, so, just as a reminder to everyone, I will be sharing the recording to this. Um, 
later today. Uh, thank you for joining us. And yeah, thanks, Phil and Trevor. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Bye.